Um, hello. Uh, we're going to start now. If the panelists could give me a thumbs up that they can hear me, that would be great. Okay, perfect. Um, hello and welcome to the 37th annual Norris and Marjorie Benditson Epic International Symposium on the topic of pro problems without passports. It's my pleasure to have you all here today on Zoom in person. Welcome to all the international delegations. I am excited to be moderating this panel on space, the final frontier. Um, outer space is a burgeoning and largely unexplored domain, still essentially open to all actors. Um, this raises many issues, both for states and governments, as well as the private industry, and it is an untapped field in terms of international policy. There are critical questions that need to be addressed in terms of glo the global governance of space, so I'm glad that it could be included in this symposium. Um, before we start, I'd first like to apologize to the panelists for starting a little late. I know, Mr. Stas, you need to leave a bit early, so I might modify the format of this panel a little bit again. Um, and three of the five of us are unwell. Um, I'm really sorry that Kate, uh, Mrs. Johnson and Mr. Goswami, you couldn't make it in person. And I apologize in advance for any nose blowing that I do. Um, so a little into the format, um, I'm first going to give a brief introduction for Mr. Stas and ask you one question so that you can engage with the audience a bit before we go. And then I'll go on to introducing all the other wonderful panels, panelists we have and then get into the moderator discussion. After that, I'll dive right into the audience Q&A. Um, so our panelists, Mr. Benjamin Stats. Mr. Stats is a second year graduate student at the Space Policy Institute. He has been serving in the United States Army over the last 15 years, the last four of which have been um, as a space operations officer. His research interests range from the implications of space on national security to the topic of planetary defense. Um, the question I wanted to ask you was related to um, space debris. So space debris can be created in many ways. There are a lot of questions about space debris from anti-satellite weapons, but there is also space debris that arises from regular space commercial activities. So I was wondering if you could sort of explain this problem and what solutions can we have in the future to deal with it? Thank you. Uh, so starting with that, it's uh, it's not just the issue of space debris generation that's occurring. It's actually uh, it's it's also efforts to prevent uh, further space debris from happening from collisions or you know ASAT attacks like you had mentioned. And then there's also an effort of also the uh, space debris remediation, so removing space debris uh, from the from the space environment. And so really, it's a, a kind of a three pronged approach. Uh, or what uh, a lot of advocates have suggested, call it a uh, space sustainability framework. Uh, and so, yes, we want to mitigate uh, space debris from uh, growing in space, but there's uh, we also have to be concerned about generating new space debris on orbit and uh, have to be concerned about how we're going to remove uh, debris from the space environment. Uh, and so when you look at that, it, it is a... Uh, there's some debate amongst the community uh, of what should be prioritized. Uh, you'll see, you know, opinions written about how we should be focusing on removing space debris because uh, there's certain large bodies that have le been left up in orbit that can uh, generate or collide with other objects and create more space debris. Uh, but really, I, I think that there has to be a deliberate effort across all three approaches uh, to kind of get uh, ahead on some of the issues that are going to continue to emerge because there's going to be more commercial activity with the mega constellations uh, that are going up. We expect you know, over 10,000 satellites uh, to be placed in orbit in the coming years, uh, potentially more than that. Uh, and, it's, and it's isolated in specific low earth orbits. Uh, and so it's going to be very challenging to not just uh, prevent more space debris from being generated, but you know, mitigate accidents from occurring that could cause a cascading effect of space debris, and also efforts to to remove space debris uh, from those uh, orbits. Thank you so much. 
Um, I'm going to ask all the other panelists if they have anything they'd like to add before they went be, before they're introduced, um, just so that we can move on to the panel introductions. Um, if anyone has anything to add on space to be. Kitten, do you, would you like to go first? Um, for me, pretty much, uh, Benjamin covered pretty much uh, the entire ground of it. Um, we do see, however, in terms of uh, norm building at international level, we do see the efforts that are being put forward by different countries. And that would be something we do have the responsible uh, space to be mitigation type guidelines that, that are something that, we, that should be followed. And then there are also uh, states such as the United uh, uh, States uh, itself that uh, incorporates those guidelines in some ways in the domestic legislation while licensing space activities. So it is not the case that it is completely untapped or people are free to create debris. The only problem that arises, I think, is more so towards um, the use of ASATs, uh, which has been uh, recent past. We have seen a couple of tests being done. So besides that, I think Benjamin covered it pretty much in the background. And I do agree that the three-pronged approach is the way to go about it. And again, I would be saying this a lot, finding legal norms are the way forward. And I would keep stressing on it until we get the, you know, the discussion today. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Mira, if I could just jump in, um, I think that you know, everyone lo loves to talk about space debris, space junk. It's an exciting and universal topic. Um, I think what we're seeing is a, a growing call from at least the space community, but probably broader to use space debris and the creation of space debris as a binding agent for international cooperation. So when we talk about destructive ASAT testing, anti-satellite testing, the ones that cause the most debris, you know, harm the environment for everybody. And there is a notion, I think in the US space community, as well as internationally, that this is some solid ground that we can all work on to create some of these norms or binding agreements to limit destructive ASAT tests, to encourage new norms on disposal of debris or on debris, um, you know, mitigation or, or cleaning up of debris. And if you're super interested in this, there were, I'm, I'm blanking on who wrote this, but there were two scholars who wrote a piece on like the 20 most dangerous pieces of space debris. And when they came out with this, I just was like, this is a great guide for nations if we want to do something actively to start with these 20 pieces. We are developing the um, technologies to clean up space debris. Let's start with cleaning up these 20 pieces that have been like scientifically, Benjamin says it's Darren McKnight, um, has uh, these pieces that have like actually the most substantial uh, potential to impact either by the fact that they're in super crowded orbits or that they're massive um, and could just cause incredible devastation in the environment. And so when I think of how the United States should take a leadership role, I think this is one avenue that could be of great benefit to the United States to show that we're very serious about cleaning the environment and keeping it sustainable for the future. Um, so I just like to point that out. So if you're interested, go find it. It was a really good piece. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have, oh, wow. Hello. Um, I don't have much to add other than I think when we think about this problem, we think about it being like, you know, a tragedy of the commons. It's so important to be proactive and not reactive. And when you're thinking about customary international law being set by norms and saying, well, you know, state practice, you don't want state practice to be, well, there was a collision and that resulted in debris and that's how we picked it up in case A, so we should do the same thing in case B. I think it's important to set these guidelines that are norms that are, like Caitlin said, binding um, so that we can really make sure we tackle the problem on the front end instead of dealing with issues of not just collision, but liability, 
um, and and all the horrible other things that happen when space objects are coming at each other at a very high speed. So, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, this question wasn't on the list that I sent you, but um, there is the liability convention. I was wondering how that could be applied to space debris in the future, um, especially as far as I know, it hasn't been applied before. Um, I know that there was one previous issue of liability, but that was sorted bilaterally. So I was wondering whether the liability convention could be applied, applied to space debris in the future. Um, Mr. Stats, if you want to start. Oh, sure, I can start. I'm, I'm, I'm certain Bayar would have a better uh, viewpoint, but given that fault uh, or liability in space in the space domain itself is fault based, uh, you have the issue of um, uh, attributing uh, that space debris uh, causing damage on another on, on another satellite down the road. So the Russian ASAT test that occurred several months ago. Uh, you know, it's, I, I believe, in a sun-synchronous uh, orbit, and there's a lot of important satellites in those orbits, and I believe this month there's a lot of near misses that are occurring from that space debris, and so we have a, we can relatively attribute if, it, if debris was supposed to hit one of those satellites, we could potentially attribute, but, I mean, the ability to actually track what tiny space debris piece hit what satellite and where was it from and, and, and doing that, especially for a, an ASAT attack or uh, launch that happened, for example, China's in 2007, there's debris that will be up there until 2047. And being able to attribute that debris to a, you know, collision or accident that happens a year from now, I, I think is really difficult to prove that fault-based liability. And I'll kind of stop there because I'm not the legal expert and, and can pass it on. Um, thank you so much. I know that you're going to have to head out really soon. So I was wondering if you could give um, a few remarks on space and the military aspects of it before you leave us. Oh, certainly. If, if, if I had to leave just a few remarks, uh, I, I would just like to point out that I think it's very important uh, I think it's great that space is being discussed in these types of forums. Uh, I think similar to what Caitlin was talking about, there are a lot of opportunities for multinational and multilateral collaboration, cooperation. Uh, and if you, because of the nature, unique nature and attributes of the space domain, uh, if you look at the fact that you, know, you can't claim sovereignty and you look at the so many new actors um, and activities ongoing in space that you know, the, the tech international relations perspective of applying force or coercing, coercing or compelling other people to, you know, uh, align with your interests just isn't really a viable pathway forward. Uh, you, you have to rely on persuasion. You have to rely on diplomacy, leadership, uh, and those that's the viable way forward. And that's why I think it's important to discuss not just the challenges and issues of uh, space, but also the many benefits that uh, space capabilities provide to us, you know, terrestrially. It's not just space research and exploration. It's also the benefits that we derive here on Earth from uh, those capabilities, whether it's position navigation timing, the huge has huge economic and safety implications, weather data, uh, uh, climate monitoring, uh, telecommunications. And if you look at all those benefits, there is some sort of UN sponsored or other multinational multilateral agreement or committee tied to those. There's the International Committee for Global Navigation uh, Satellite Services to, you know, that promotes, you know, cooperation and deconfliction amongst all the different uh, uh, constellations that provide PNT services. You have the World Meteorological Organization that fosters, uh, you know, data corroboration with, you know, in support of atmospheric and climatology. You have the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. I mean, the list goes on. You, even commercial, there's non-government organizations like the Space Data Association. You have all these avenues for you know, that have generated from uh, the space domain. Uh, all these avenues for multinational, multilateral co cooperation. And so I think that there's a lot of benefit and opportunities moving forward. And I think that's why it's important to talk about space uh, moving forward. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, 
Now we're going to go back to introducing the panelists, as you must have already seen this, super knowledgeable. Um, so I'm going to start with Ms. Caitlin Johnson. It's my pleasure to introduce <laughs> you. Um, Ms. Johnson is the Deputy Director and Fellow uh, of the Aerospace Security Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Her research specializes in topics such as space security, military space systems, and commercial and civil space policy. Um, there are more detailed bios on our website. I'm just keeping them short for time. Um, Ms. Caitlin Johnson, welcome, and I hope that you can give your opening remarks now. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you today. I guess our panel has been struck by uh, some some spring illnesses, and so we're all taking it, except for Sophia, from home. Um, it is a delight to talk with you, though, and I just wanted to kind of give a quick introduction of CSIS and our work in case you haven't heard of us before. Um, so like Mira said, I work for the Aerospace Security Project at CSIS. CSIS is a bipartisan nonprofit think tank here in Washington, DC. We had the absolute delight of having Mira as our summer intern last summer. Um, and so we do take internships where, um, you know, we're just finishing hiring for the summer, but we take uh, interns like every semester. So if space policy is something you are interested in learning more about, internships, especially those that can be done virtually like ours, are, is, is a great way to kind of get your foot in the door to see if this is something you want to pursue. We think about our research in kind of three buckets. The first is air dominance and long range strike. The second is uh, space security. And then the last is civil and commercial space. And I will say my expertise tends to lend to the last two um, with a bit of an emphasis on space security more than civil and commercial space. But I did just uh, do a really deep dive into cislunar and lunar missions that are planned for the next decade or so. Um, but anyway, we conduct open source uh, research that helps kind of educate and inform policymakers so that they can make more informed decisions. You know, their uh, policymakers are often super busy putting out fires, dealing with the chaos of politics that surprisingly they don't have a ton of time to dig into really detailed subject areas and topics. And so what we think we bring to the table is that we kind of break down these technically complicated subjects or we do the deep dive of research and then we present the facts and the analysis in a bipartisan way. We're never trying to swing anyone one way or another. Um, and it really allows us to have a seat at the table in between and outside of politics, as well as getting all parties involved, you know, different ideas. Luckily for us, space is relatively bipartisan. Um, and so we don't have to deal with it too much. But right now we are just wrapping up uh, the research and publication of one of our flagship reports called the Space Threat Assessment. This will be our fifth edition uh, that we have done. It's going to get published on Monday. So I'm happy, Mira, if you want to dive into that to tell you some like early insights that we found during that research. Um, but that is really what our team is focusing on right now. Thank you so much. We're definitely going to get to the space threat assessment, obviously. Um, I want to ask a quick follow-up question on your remarks. Why do you think space has remained a bipartisan issue? Yeah, I think it's a, I mean, that's a really interesting case study. I think it'd make a really interesting thesis if any of you are out there are looking for ideas. Um, for me, you know, we see the bipartisan nature of space as something that's kind of got this historic legacy. Um, space as a, a national power has always been uh, a, a tool leveraged by the U.S. government, not always as um, out in front as it was in the Apollo area, but we kind of see a resurgence now more with commercial space and then NASA's pivot to the moon uh, with the Artemis program. And so Luckily, you know, there's not too much contention in space. We'll kind of see some um, based on administration preferences, uh, but relatively they're pretty minimal. And I, you know, I, I wonder if it's because it has this historic 
legacy of, of success and of exploration and of um, community. But so far, I, um, we haven't seen too many disagreements. Um, I'm going to go on to introducing our next panelist, Mr. Bayar Goswami. Mr. Goswami is an Arsenal Doctoral Fellow at the Institute of Air and Space Law at McGill University. Bayar is also involved in the project to curate the McGill Encyclopedia for International Space Law. Very important, given that there are not many definitions for things in space. Um, and also in the research and publica publication of the McGill Manual um, on International Space Law applicable to military uses of space. Um, Mr. Goswami, would you like to start with your opening remarks? Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm so sorry I couldn't be there in person. I apparently managed to stay COVID free for two, two and a half years. And just towards the fag end of it, I managed to contract it. But then I'm delighted to be joining virtually. And thank you so much for the kind introduction again. Uh, with regards to, um, I mean, we'll obviously talk about I'd be happy to talk about the encyclopedia project that we're uh, working on and also Milamos, which is uh, one of the uh, flagship projects that we are doing at McGill and it's going to be quite uh, cutting edge once it's published. And we are very soon and very, uh, we're very close to publishing it uh, in the coming months. Uh, with regards to my opening remarks, I think uh, I, I would take a position and this would perhaps be a good starting position to open the discussion. It would be that the way title is based the final frontier, we have to de-escalate the conversation. We have to de-weaponize and think about space. Of course, think about space from security perspectives, but also not forget the um, uh, the negotiating history of the Outer Space Treaty. Where does the fundamental or fundamental principles of space law come from. They come from the Outer Space Treaty, which was drafted and negotiated um, in times which when the world was just coming out of two world wars, there was an ongoing Cold War. Uh, we were also just coming out of the entire process of colonization. So there was a huge movement against decolonization, hence we see. And we see all of these reflections uh, of the recent learnings in history embedded in the outer space. We see non-appropriation because we wanted to avoid space to be a race towards resources. We wanted to de-conflict or de-escalate conflicts or not have a race towards weaponization or militarization of outer space. Do you find provisions in outer space treaty which are towards more cooperative and peaceful uses of space? So while, of course, the realities and the geopolitical tensions tend to lean on the side that space is becoming a war fighting domain, but it only becomes so if you continue to push it towards that and forget where the outer space law and where the international cooperation, particularly in terms of outer space, uh, got started from. So there are many activities that are still happening in outer space, which may be in the gray area of outer space treaty, but then we always have to draw the links back to the negotiating history and the circumstances that the treaty was brought in, particularly for the member state. So uh, with that as an opening remark, I would just say that as we move on to different discussions, I would keep bringing back that, that whatever we find in outer space treaty has a very significant position and uh, history in what was happening in the world at, at the point in time and why a certain provision that we find in outer space treaty is to be found. There is a very solid logic and rationale. And there are uh, statements by uh, countries who are negotiating and drafting the treaty uh, to that effect to show their commitment towards the peaceful nature of uh, maintaining outer space for peaceful purposes, or uh, let's say, avoid a race to resources or militarization of weapons. And so with just that background, we should head to our next stop. I think uh, that would be my hope. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And with that, I'm going to introduce our last speaker who is here with us today. Um, thank you so much for joining in last minute. Um, our fourth panelist is Mrs. Sophia Warner. Uh, Mrs. Warner is a first year graduate student at the Fletcher School studying security and technology with a concentration in space law and policy. 
Sophia's research focuses um, on the role of low Earth orbit satellites in digital connectivity and security. Um, and she's also writing a master's thesis on the future of lunar governance and great power competition over lunar resources and lunar resource, ma resource management. Given that, Caitlin, you just came out with a paper on that, I'm sure we can talk about the moon um, later as well. I love talking about the moon. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I, um, I'll preface this by saying I am not an expert. Your experts are here, but I am a wannabe expert and it's been really great on the student side and I'm just assuming a lot of you are students here at Tufts and I'm at Fletcher just down the road um, and it's been really great to explore this new domain specifically not just in the security sense um, and technology sense but also in academia as well um, and I think for me the interest really did start just I was a teacher for two years in Berlin and it was great talking to my students about robots and AI and I realized in the course of those two years, especially when COVID hit and I had a lot of time uh, to do research and I always would check the news and what was going on in the States just because I was a little homesick and I was trying to not only, you know, prepare lessons, but also like, you know, stay connected. It was great to see the rise of space and, and space exploration and changes in the news. And I think something that we talk about a lot at Fletcher is that you can't separate land from sea from cyber and space it doesn't happen in a vacuum and it's been really great to get that multidisciplinary um approach you know right down the road um and the support obviously that i've received and not just from the fletcher community but, you know having talked to caitlin um before and having reached out to experts in the field and i think something for me that's really important of course low earth orbit satellites the moon so fun to talk about but you see a lot of these conversations in conversations happening top down. So you see NASA, you see these think tanks and they have great research and they share, but there's not much that we're doing in education to really shape the culture of space and to shape like how our nation sees itself um, like in this, in, this, in this world or in this space. And I think that you sort of need to teach yourself or at least we should all try to teach ourselves how to speak space and start early. So even if you're in a class on Oh, I don't know. It's been a while. If you're talking about the Cold War, if you're, you're if you're talking about even, you know, I don't know, I'm thinking about Fletcher classes, but we have classes on mergers and acquisitions. Um, we have classes on strategy and grand strategy. And I think that space can't be separated from that. Um, and of course, I know it's it's a scary domain. Um, there are a lot of, of threats, but it's really important to get excited about the opportunities as well. And you can't get there if you don't really teach yourself how to um, yeah, speak speak the language of space. And so I, I guess, as a graduate student, I'm happy to talk about my experiences and the conversations being had at Fletcher um, and how you all, as, you know, budding space scholars or just people who want to be better in the loop with all of this can connect your field to space. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to dive right into the questions now. Um, Mr. Goswami, since you spoke a little bit about the history of the space domain, I wonder if you can talk about what are the space laws and norms that govern the domain as well? Who are the primary actors? <clears throat> well, that's a very interesting but also a very broad question i don't know how much can i touch upon that but in terms of let me get uh the simple ones uh, out of space so in terms of who are the actors today we definitely see uh so state uh space started from being a very state dominated domain that only countries or uh, what we uh, in, in in the politics of the law we call states uh, it started from there, but today the scenario is, of course, all, all of us know, is continuously changing and we do see private actors. We do also see international organizations uh, who have their separate identity as such in international law, participating as uh, in a space activity as an independent being. So we, at the moment, I think we have at least three uh, very identifiable actors, which are the states. Now, states can be civil or military. Uh, states can be uh, from a uh, civil and military side. It could also be from a private actor point of view that we have space hikes, we have uh, different other, other, other different corporations who are now taking part in space activities. So we do have that. 
Uh, in terms of laws, uh, now that we come to, it's very important to also understand what, there are a few fundamental principles that would that do govern our space. And space is not as lawless as uh, people who don't know about space law uh, may think. Uh, in terms of what are the fundamental principles, most of them would be, I think, the most important one is uh, the freedom of exploration and uses of our space. So our space remains free to be explored and used for all countries and in the interest of all countries alike. It does not matter if somebody is, uh, if a state is a party to the treaty or not, that provision in the Outer Space Treaty, the very first provision, talks about the right of all the states alike to explore and use the Earth. In terms of the second most important uh, provision that I would say, or the law that governs Outer Space, would be the non appropriation principle. It basically says that no state or no private corporation or nobody by any means can claim Outer Space. Um, by any means, it could be by sovereignty, it could be by uh, commercial exploration, anything by any means, nobody can claim any part of outer space for perpetuity or for exclusive uh, uses as such. Um, third or fourth most, I would say there is definitely a hint of uh, peaceful exploration where the Outer Space Treaty defines two uh, spatial grounds on which it dis distinguishes what can be exclusively peaceful purpose. So the celestial bodies, the moon and the other celestial bodies have to remain exclusively peaceful. There can be no military activity, no matter what, on the surface of the moon and the celestial bodies, except for scientific uh, purposes and peaceful exploration. So no military activities on uh, the celestial bodies, basically. However, in the vacuum of space, what we call the orbit or the deep space, there can be certain military activities. However, you are still prohibited to deploy nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction in outer space. However, conventional weapons are still allowed, not allowed in the sense that the outer space treaty actually says that this would be allowed, but it's allowed by implication because outer space treaty only talks about that weapons of mass destruction or nuclear weapons are prohibited in the space. Um, I think one of the most, again, important principle that one should bear in mind and when we talk about outer space or space law is this principle or the rule of responsibility. So no matter who in terms of um, actor, when we talk about actors, whether it's SpaceX, whether it's a private corporation or an international organization, it would always be the case that states are responsible for activities originating in their territories or so far as they have a connection with the actor. So it is never the case, which is unlike international law in general, actually, because in international law, there is a principle of attribution that you have to determine uh, what was the connection between the state and the private entity. But in space law, it's a very clear cut uh, principle that a state would always be responsible for the activity of national. So that could be private, that could be a state be taking part in an international organization itself. So a state basically becomes responsible. Now, the last, I would say, I mean, that I could keep talking about it, but then the last and one was one of the other most important uh, principles would be the principle of liability that when a damage is caused by a space object of a state to other space objects, then there are rules to determine liability in terms of when it happens in space, you have to, uh, what Benjamin said, you have to affix a fault as to who was at fault to create that damage and the states would be uh, liable for causing such damage. In terms of when the damage is caused in airspace or on the surface of the earth, as it happened in the Soviet Union and uh, Cosmos 954 case, uh, where there was uh, a space object that had fallen onto Canadian territory and it had nuclear radiation, uh, a state remains absolutely liable. You don't have to fix fault as as so far as you can ascertain that this space will, a space object belongs to this state. Any damage following in outer space, uh, in airspace or on the surface of the Earth would be affixed to the state 
uh, in question. So those, I think, would be the most uh, fundamental principles that we do talk about and deal with in outer space, among many other. But then I mean, I'm sure we'll get to them once we get into the discussion more uh, elaborately. Um, thank you so much. That was a very good broad understanding of an even broader topic. Um, Ms. Johnson or Ms. Warner, do you have anything additional to add on actors in space or laws and policies? I, would, I mean, I don't really have much to add. I think Bayar gave a great overview. I would just say that, you know, I would reinforce what he said that the space domain is changing in its nature of, of actors. And um, while the origins of space or, or what we like to call the first space age um, was primarily the domain of nation states, the uh, United States, Russia, um, and, and a few others. It is now not only more diverse in different countries acting in space, but the commercial capability is so much that they have as much or sometimes more responsibility and satellites on orbit than nations do. Starlink, for example, SpaceX, the satellite constellation, they have more satellites on orbit than China um, and Russia, I believe. I mean, it's it's incredible. And, and yes, these are small satellites in low Earth orbit, um, but the stake of commercial companies is equal to that of nation states right now which is causing a really interesting dynamic um, as we look at, I think, you know, as the lawyers look at the legal stuff, but as policymakers, as we look at the different policies and regulations, at least in the United States that we have um, for liability, for insurance, for um, other culpability, security practices, uh, there's a lot of questions up in the air, especially that we're seeing right now with so many commercial actors involved in the conflict in Ukraine. Um, it's throwing a lot of this into question, and it's a really interesting time to be studying this. Yeah, um, the only thing that I would add, and Kaylin touched on it a little bit, but if anyone is, and this is from uh, one moot court, space moot court competition experience that I have, the, the extent of my legal knowledge, but um, if you have, you know, time for some light reading um, and want to learn more about kind of this commercial side of space, definitely look into the Space Assets Protocol and the Cape Town Convention, because that really kind of changed the game, uh, looking at these private actors. And Mark Sundahl has a great book on it that you can find at the Ginn Library. Um, so if anyone really wants to read not just the Outer Space Treaty, the Liability Convention, but then look at these additions that are happening um, and that are also part of the conversation um, I highly encourage you to, to go that way. Thank you so much. Um, since Mr. Stats left us on the militarization of space, I was hoping to get back into that topic. Um, Ms. Johnson, you mentioned that ASP releases the space threat assessment every year. Um, this question is in two parts. Could you talk about the ex existing space warfare and anti-satellite capabilities? how they've evolved and some insights from the upcoming report. Um, and on the other hand, uh, Mr. Goswami, you touched on this a bit, uh, but Caitlin, could you speak about how does, how does the militarization of space fit into the requirement in the Outer Space Treaty for space to be used for primarily peaceful purposes? Two really big questions. I can assuredly tackle the first. The second, we might need to leave to the lawyers, but I'll give you my, my two cents. So yes, CSIS, along with our good friends at the Secure World Foundation, publish a annual report looking at the developments and testing of counter space weapons. Um, we have a framework for defining those. We have developed frameworks of like what kind of weapon and what kind of impact they can have. Are they reversible? How hard is it to attribute? Lots of things. So if you're really interested in this, I would look there. Um, I want to start with saying that space has always been militarized. The first satellites launched into space were for military purposes, primarily nuclear command and control, early missile warning, and that remains uh, true to, to this day. What is changing is the weaponization of the space domain. Um, 
And there are a couple ways we can talk about space weapons. And, and my boss, Todd, wrote a really great report looking at a very simple framework of outlining space weapons, which is based on where they're located. Are they located on the ground? Are they located in space? And then where is the impact? Is the impact on the ground? Is the impact in space? Um, lays it out kind of nicely and simply. What we're finding in our counter space, our space threat assessment is the growing proliferation and use of ground-based counter space weapons. So this is primarily jamming technology and spoofing technology, electronic forms of counter space weapons. Um, jamming is when you, you know, create a lot of radio frequency noise that's of a similar radio frequency as the satellites communicating. And you can affect ground stations or ground receivers um, and basically block them from getting that signal. Spoofing is when you trick that receiver into thinking that your signal is the real one. Um, and both of these have proliferated in, in interesting ways, both by like the sheer number of instances we've found and the amount of use that we've seen, but also in the diversity of actors that we've seen using these. So when we started this research five years ago, jamming technology was primarily used by nation states like Russia and China. Um, the US obviously has jamming technology as well, um, but very like state oriented. Now we're seeing jamming and spoofing technology used by non-state actors, used by individuals, not for like nefarious purposes, but for their own reasons. One of my favorite stories from this year's space threat assessment is that there's actually a lot of like food delivery drivers in Indonesia who use a app that spoofs their GPS location so that they are uh, that their phone is giving off a signal that they are closer to whatever checkpoint or restaurant that they need to be um, at so that they don't have to wait in a parking lot in the rain so that they can wait like under shelter a mile away or something like that. It's amazing. And so between that and like I found a spoofing manual on GitHub, I mean, it's just like it's everywhere. And it really to me shows that this technology is not necessarily affecting the satellite in space. It's not damaging the satellite, but it's damaging your uh, your use of the satellite. Um, and that is what we're seeing around Ukraine and in Ukraine with Russian invasion. We saw it for a couple months before. Um, it, the Russian jamming was affecting uh, drones from the OSCE from taking off and performing overflight, uh, you know, kind of humanitarian safety missions and uh so it was jamming the gps signal basically and so we continue to see that today in russia i'm sure that story will evolve we only kind of got to scratch the surface with our our publication deadlines um the other worrisome trend that we're seeing is the frequency of disruptive kinetic physical uh direct ascent ASATs. So basically what you probably think of when you hear ASAT, which is um, a missile launched from Earth that dis that hits a satellite on orbit. We saw Russia in November of 2021 attack one of the so uh, dead Soviet Union satellites that was in low Earth orbit. It caused substantial space debris. Uh, that debris was launched into the same orbit as the International Space Station and put the astronauts and cosmonauts at risk. The Chinese have said that it put their space station at risk as well. Um, and then, you know, the so that was surprising and damaging. We had assessed at least that they had this technology and we knew that. Um, India had, al had also conducted a test in 2019. Uh, the United States conducted a similar test in 2018. 2008 and, and China in 2007. Um, there's a lot of guesswork of like why the countries are now testing this technology again. But I think what's really noticeable is that to test this technology, you don't actually have to hit a satellite in space, right? You can kind of point at a point in space that's not occupied by anything and say, we're going to hit there. And if you, you can hit it, you know, it, it kind of proves the technology without having to cause all of this damaging space debris. 
And so there are a couple reasons of like signaling national pride, being grandfathered in if anyone, you know, agrees to a ASAT, um, a direct descent ASAT ban, kind of like the nuclear uh, grandfather in nuclear states, things like that. Um, you know, what this means for peaceful uses of outer space, I will leave to the lawyers. I'm sure there's a lot of legal terms there. So far, we have not seen any state attack a different state's satellite, like actively attack their satellite. We have seen them block GPS signals. Uh, we have seen dazzling attempts or cyber hack attempts in the past, but nothing that has been like a full front attack in space on another satellite. Um, so I'm not sure how that fits in to the legal conversation, um, but I certainly don't think it helps. Um, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Goswami, if you could take the peaceful use question and also introduce Milamos, that would be great. Um, and I would ask that we keep the answers to say three to four minutes so we can get in more of them before the time elapses. Sure. So uh, in terms of peaceful uses, it's, uh, it's a very simple logic that uh, outer space treaty establishes. So from a legal point of view, outer space is not exclusively peaceful. So the, when, when the treaty was being drafted and negotiated, uh, there was a lot of conversation around whether to make outer space entirely exclusively peaceful to say that no military activity ever is allowed. And that's not the case that uh, got diluted into or got the principle that got accepted as a treaty binding obligation. Again, like I said, the treaty establishes two uh, hierarchies. The moon and the other celestial bodies are exclusively peaceful and you can have no military activity or weaponization whatsoever, but the outer space in the void and the orbits remain uh, non-aggressive views, right? So that, uh, that's the interpretation that was given to the peaceful purposes uh, term. Um, so in the orbit and in the deep space, you could still have weapons that are not weapons of mass destruction or nuclear weapons, and you could have conventional weapons. And uh, of course, we, we talk about the kinetic or non-kinetic uh, ASAT. So we do have uh, that problem in space law that to a certain extent, military activities and weaponization is by implication allowed. So we do have to tackle that in terms of uh, responsible behavior. And like Katie mentioned that, while ASAT technology, particularly the kinetic ASAT, which actually have a physical impact on create it, those could be tested without actually creating debris. Why do states choose to uh, go around shooting their own satellites and creating debris that uh, poses threat to everybody's use and access of space? So that's something to be uh, thought about from international policy and legal uh, legally binding norms point of view. And there's also a conversation about how it is an indiscriminate attack because we have to understand that whenever there is a physical impact in outer space, whether you're, create, uh, whether you're destroying your own satellite or somebody else's, you are potentially creating an indiscriminate uh, impact on the use and access of outer space for everybody. So it's not a terrestrial uh, conflict which only impacts the two of you or terrestrially at least, but in space, any impact which creates physical debris affects every other state's uh, freedom to use and explore outer space. So we have to keep that in mind. And states have to comply. Uh, bear in mind while uh, you know potentially defining their behavior in outer space. In terms of uh, now coming to Milamos, what we are doing is we are identifying laws which uh, are applicable to the military use of outer space. So far, yet outer space treaty is the outer space treaty and the other convention that we have in space law are the only governing uh, dictation rather to the militaries of nation states, and they can be interpreted one way or the other. And not every time space law tells that militaries can do this or that, but there is an ascertainable amount of law uh, existing that can be defined by international experts to say that this is the existing law that would apply to this military activity. And that is the entire uh, 
exercise that we have engaged uh, that we have engaged in with respect to Manamos, where we have international experts from around the world who represent their own uh, geographic and uh, understanding of law, geographical understanding of law, and basically we all of us arrive at consensus on let's say a principle. What is the law about national law? Let's say about appropriation and also what is the law about uh, radio frequency jamming or what is the law about laser dazzling? So the experts come to a consensus about this is the existing law and it is then supplemented by commentary, the legal legal basis of the rule statement, the commentary, and uh, the future uh, issues and ongoing challenges. So that is where the project is situated in, and it is basically a manual to aid uh, and uh, assist uh, the military uh, activities in our space so that there is a more uh, clear understanding of law who are actually, uh, to people who are actually engaged in um, doing space activity from a military point of view. Thank you so much. I really look forward to reading the manual. Um, on the militarization of space, um, I'd like to ask you um, if you could speak a little bit about the dual use nature of space and satellites in low Earth orbit, and how could that play out in the future in terms of space warfare? Ooh, okay. Um, yeah, so I, so everyone sort of, or it seems to me these days, kind of talking about low Earth orbit satellites. Um, and they're different for a few reasons. So they're kind of constantly orbiting the Earth. Obviously, they're closer. Um, but the thing is, and this is something that I'm exploring in one of my classes, actually, in a privacy class, is that they are more susceptible to kind of infiltration and, and, uh, and data breaches. And due to their inherently, I think, I don't know if they're smaller, and of course, the experts can correct me if I'm wrong, um, as I just started this research, but um, they have to, they, you can't equip them with a lot of like technology, like they can't hold as much as, you know, the, the, the high Earth orbit, um, orbit satellites. And so when we look at kind of like Caitlin was talking, jamming and spoofing, it's not just one satellite, it's a whole constellation because they work better when there's there's more of them kind of constantly rotating. Um, so I've, I've sort of started looking at things such as, you know, space-based blockchain and kind of looking at um, like quantum encryption. And I think, again, sort of tying it back to what I said at the beginning, when you look at military purposes and that the Space Force right now is looking to get a constellation of military satellites in low earth orbit it's not just the regulations up there like yes responsibility and liability but actually making sure that they not only comply with the regulations that exist right now but their their systems on board are proactive enough to make sure that we um you know are are not hacked because of course a lot of these conversations are difficult to have because it is national security concerns um and so information is not available. And so again, I think um, his name, he left, Ben, Ben was talking about compellence and deterrence um, and all that good, you know, the functions of force uh, that we talk about in IR, like those all change, uh, I think, in space, especially when now like the defense is inherently the offense when it comes to cyber uh, and being proactive. But I think the conversation, especially about satellites, is that it's not just military purposes. And that's sort of why I started researching you know, LEO satellites and the Starlink fleet and bridging the digital divide and hel helping people, you know, in hard to reach places get Wi-Fi and access to the internet, um, helping, you know, indigenous communities and their schools be better connected, especially when, um, when we look at inclusivity and issues of just like social justice and education, um, especially now with COVID, people need to be connected. And if the FCC, you know, is preaching these things of, like, yes, get everyone on the grid and digital connect connectivity, I think LEO satellites are a great, great opportunity for that. And so I think that a huge, of course, like we can talk military all day long and talk about all those challenges, but don't forget the aspect as well, or especially in, you know, humanitarian challenges. Um, I think Spire, I think, um, what's ISI and Spire are companies that are doing great work with satellites when it comes to just like monitoring climate change um, and looking at that data. So again, 
yeah, none of it happening in a vacuum. And, and I like to consider, you know, satellites like really not just dual use, but multi-purpose technologies that have a lot of potential. Um, in the future, I think the companies that are really leading that conversation need to figure out really where their market is and how they can collaborate with other other actors, but also make sure that they're getting the most benefits like out of their market. So love satellites, happy to talk, happy to talk, but I know that we're running out of time. Um, yeah, on that, I want to ask my last moderated question on similar notes of your answer right now. So space, space exploration requ requires huge capital investments. And a worry I personally have is that it will not only reflect the inequalities on Earth, like development of space will not only reflect the inequalities on Earth, but also exacerbate them. How can we ensure that space is developed equitably? Um, do you want to start, Ms. Warner? Wow. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it needs to be. And I think when we look at the Outer Space Treaty, and I think kind of like um, Mr. Goswami was saying, like the, the use for all, right? And I think that's going to require not just, you know, UN COPUS, like UN USA Outer Space Agency, not just those agencies, but having everyone work in tandem and share projects and share information because that's in the Outer Space Treaty as well. Um, Article 11, maybe? I knew it last week for the competition. Um, but it's, it's not just about having these capabilities and profiting, um, but it's also about being able to share information. And I think we have to strike that right balance. And it's, it's not a difficult thing to do. It's definitely going to take time. And that is why I kind of lean back to Again, space is this academic domain that should be explored on all levels, um, from kindergarten all the way up, you know, grad school, law school. And so um, if we start the conversation of, you know, space is something that touches on everything that humanitarian actors, two military actors can be involved, I think that opens the door. And um, I hate to be the person, I always hate it when people said this on panels and I'm on a panel saying it, but like, really starts with the youth like it really does like getting people excited just the fact that you're having something like this and then allowing more opportunities for research allowing more grants that are not just on the stem side but also on the policy side i think will really help um kind of bridge the gaps that exist um yeah thank you so much um mr goswami do you want to go next sure Oh, well, I could talk about this endlessly. <laughs> uh, in terms of how to strike equity and responsibility in terms of uh, benefit sharing, and I mean, people have written theses and books about it. And what we really need to understand is how do we understand what uh, benefit sharing or uh, striking equity means? So while one may say that, you know, only the advanced nation or the first world countries are getting to exploit or explore and use outer space to best of their capabilities. But then, I mean, there also is a conversation to be had in terms of how those technologies and information that we gain or the scientific advancements that we make are then shared with the world uh, in, in generally. And there, there is also an entire conversation about how spin-off of space technologies has benefited uh, different countries who would have never thought about uh, that this technology is coming from actually a space domain, but is now being utilized to do something else. So that there are a lot of spin-off technologies that are coming from of building space technology. So it's not just about, uh, it's not, just, the conversation shouldn't just be about or limited to the idea of how that, you know, the third world countries or the, the countries that haven't had access to outer space also need to reach uh, space. The benefit sharing and the interest of all countries can easily be tied and weaved into, you know, the broader understanding of how space has benefited the entire globe and countries uh, Altogether, in terms of uh, whether it is a worry that post world countries or the space powers would continue to dominate, uh, dominate outer space. Um, again, this is a conversation which I can have for hours together, but then we do need to understand what philosophy or what understanding of society are we taking to outer space. So I usually talk about uh, on Earth, we have seen. Um, Anthropocentrism as the problem of most things that we think that anything or any natural resource that we see out there is for us to consume and exploit. And is that the philosophy that we want to 
take into our space because on earth that philosophy or that style of uh, exploring or exploiting the earthly resources has led us into uh, the scene where we now see that humanity in totality has become a geophysical force affecting the forces of the earth. Right? So are we, have we become a global force against the nature itself? And is that the philosophy that we want to take to our space? Is that a value paradigm that we want to take to our space and exploit our space in a very similar fashion? Is something more uh, broader than just law and policy conversation or a STEM conversation? So I completely agree with uh, what was said before that uh, space has to be opened up for social scientists and social scientists need to be very invested and see very carefully and critically what is happening in outer space and how to assess humanity's role in exploration and humanity's involvement in outer space as to what is going to happen next. And it is not purely now just a domain for uh, the STEM or space sciences as we uh, used to know about it. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Johnson. Yeah, Mira, I don't have too much to add. I think, um, you know, my failed panelists really hit the highlights of these issues and there are experts studying this all over the place who are much more informed than me. I'll just say that kind of to the end of Bayar's comments of, of what concerns me is the, the resource exploitation and the attitude that at least the United States is taking towards it. So we've seen with several legal statements and documents, but also is primarily in the Artemis Accords that the United States is sanctioning the idea of kind of finders keepers with what resources you can extract from the moon and other celestial bodies. Um, from my research on cislunar and lunar missions that are planned, most are devoted to science and building long-term logistical structures to have kind of a more um, long-term presence on the moon. The science is really like most of it is focused on finding water and ice, especially in the poles, uh, which is, is an incredible resource that could again be exploited. Um, and so I have to agree that it's a worrisome outlook that the United States, as well as the like 15 or 16 other nations who have signed on to the Artemis Accords um, are taking in this. And I think, you know, I worry that it's driving competition. Um, sorry, I worry that it's driving competition between actors and it's promoting this this worry that um, nations could have a first mover advantage of who gets to which place on the moon first, um, as well as other, you know, valuable assets. So it's, it's a hard balance too, because you think of the economies that are out in space, uh, the potential that is out there as well to develop new technologies to discover new things and uh, new resources that could alleviate some of the strife we have here on Earth. Um, it's just, it's a hard question. And we need, like my panel said, everyone to be at the table to think and talk about these issues. Um, thank you so much. And now, now I'd like to open the floor to questions. If you could come up to the mic. Hello. Hey. Hello. What? Just speak up the battery. I gotta change. Okay. Oh, hello. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the panelists for introducing us to this field and how humanity go boldly go where no one has gone before. And I, my question is for Mr. Goswami initially, but. Um, happy to hear other panelists' comments as well. And it is on space mining. Uh, you mentioned two principles that govern the um, you know general rules of international cooperation on space law. Two of them are the freedom of exploration and discovery, and um, you know the rule of no appropriation. Oh, there it is. Is it better now? Do you want me to repeat or? 
Okay. Well, first, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Antonio Viana. I am a law student at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And I was commenting on one thing that Mr. Goswami mentioned, but which are the two principles, two of the principles that govern international cooperation in space, the idea of freedom of exploration and discovery and um, the rule of no appropriation. And I imagine situations in the future when we talk about space mining where those two principles collide, when states or even private companies start to you know, be interested in uh, exploring economically goods in asteroids and celestial bodies that are in, in the space. How do you see ways for us to balance those principles? Like how can we incentivize economic exploration without bringing you know, the same problems that we see in climate change on Earth to other planets and uh, outside? So that's a that's a very interesting question and a very important one as well. Uh, so in terms of space mining, when so in when we talk about the outer space treaty, there is no apparent conflict in terms of Article One or Article Two when we talk about freedom of exploration and use versus the non-appropriation principle. Because when freedom of exploration and use is being talked about or being embedded into outer space treaty, it is for the interest of all countries without discrimination of any kind, right? So that is one principle that is embedded in our space. When we talk about non-appropriation, it's a prohibition on any claim that is made in exclusivity. So when we talk about the mining or when you talk about resource extraction, when it is, whether it is about asteroid capturing an entire, entire asteroid or mining uh, the lunar base. So, it is not so much in the interest uh, of all countries because then what a state is engaging in is engaging in private venture, let's say for its own commercial purposes. So that is somewhat, uh, not somewhat, but completely prohibited. So there is no as such apparent conflict between the two principles. Uh, what we do now see is because of the, the there is now uh, a new space age, if we want to say that, so the new space age is triggering new interests and evolving uh, with evolving technology. We do see a lot of uh, vested interest in terms of outer space and space resources. Particularly. So a lot of countries, including the US, have come out and said that space resources, whoever finds it will keep it. It's like the old uh, Californian gold rush. <laughs> but it is not the case as such because when, when we really uh, interpret the outer space treaty the right way, if I may say, which includes the background and uh, the circumstances that the treaty was drafted in, including the statements from the uh, US ambassador. It is very clear that it is uh, appropriation is prohibited for any need. So no commercial activity or no private activity or no state or military activity can appropriate any part of space for whatever purpose. So yes, there is now a changing narrative that is being ascribed onto outer space treaty with uh, with what we see in Artemis Accord. It is a unilateral uh, push against the interpretation or a reinvention of interpretation of outer space treaty, and that remains to be seen. How well does that float? Whether that changes the interpretation that is embedded in the outer space treaty, or that requires a complete upcycle or a formation of a new law and understanding. In terms of what is already in place, I think a great way to go about it could be the Moon Agreement. That is another agreement which is not so successful in outer space, but uh, it's called the Moon Agreement, the GD governing the Moon and other such bodies, and um, which basically prescribes that this, uh, resources are common heritage of all mankind or all humankind. Uh, and uh, there would be a mechanism to distribute these resources equitably and more appropriately once it becomes uh, a reality or a possibility. So maybe that's a way to go about it, but there is no clear answer as to how at the moment we stand in terms of uh, base resource extraction, because there are vested interests and there is a very clear law that prohibits it. So that would be my response. Thank you very much.
Testing, testing. Is this one on? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, hello. My name is Isabella. I'm a senior studying political science at Tufts. Um, and this question was directed for uh, Ms. Johnson. So alongside international efforts to create legal norms in space, many governments are creating national space policies that feature com commercial interests. Um, this comes from the rapid development of space technologies, like you've said, privatization of data, venture financing in the private sphere. Um, can you speak a little bit more to how commercial interests are playing a part in forming international space policy and the risk of tech giants in this sphere, like SpaceX, Blue Origin, and others monopolizing space technologies? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I'm going to be honest with you. It's not something that I've studied super deeply, so I'll just kind of give you my two cents. Um, I think we're, we're seeing the impact of commercial space in several ways. Um, I do think that they that commercial companies have um, engaged with the UN. There are several out, out, outlets in the UN right now that are focused on space, whether that is the Office of Outer Space Affairs or the open-ended working group that's about to start on space weaponization uh, in the Conference of Disarmament. And I know there's a lot of forum there. I think in the United States, from what I've been hearing about US-based companies, their, their avenues are to lobby and discuss with the government. So we see a lot of um, space companies and new space companies who have VPs of business development or government affairs, whose job it is to Kind of talk with policymakers about their concerns about regulation or where they think the government could better protect industry or better give industry um, more leverage to develop new technologies and lean in. So one area that I've seen this recently is with um, nuclear propulsion, which is a, a good opportunity for new space companies. Um, it's something that we are going to need if we want to have long-term sustainability and, and uh, people living and working in space. But the way the U.S. government regulations have been structured is that nuclear material is really, um, you know, managed really carefully and often only within government hands. And so allowing the commercial companies to have access um, to nuclear material to test and develop these propulsion technologies is something that they've been working towards. And I think um, it's something that the Trump administration picked up and it's something that I think the Biden administration is going to move forward with is allowing companies to start developing this. Now, it's not the same material in grade that you would need for a nuclear weapon, but, you know, it's still dangerous. Um, so things like that. I, you know, at, on the international scale, I haven't seen too much um, other than like the impact of Elon Musk's Twitter, but uh, mostly, you know, mostly it's internal. It's working with their own congressmen and senators and working with the different committees as well as, you know, they have avenues and discussions with people at state, people at NASA, people in DOD. The interesting thing about space in the United States, at least, is that there are a dozen different agencies and offices that cover different pieces of the United States space um portfolio i guess you could say and so a lot of companies are having you know staff on hand who have like have expertise and have those connections so that they can um better understand the policies that are getting passed and then kind of leverage you know their connections so that they can get policies that are maybe in favor of their interests great thank you hi um, Okay. Hi, my name is Janya. Um, I'm majoring in computer science and international relations, and I'm a member of the Epic Colloquium. Uh, this question is directed at Ms. Warner. Um, you discussed uh, the role of satellite technology, and I was really interested in looking at how it can be applied to the issue of space debris, um, specifically looking at the existence of computer programs to track where space debris will travel to. So I'm wondering if you've conducted any research on this and know about this innovation at all. Um, yeah, I was actually reading about this the other day, um, but I know so space. So satellites, I know, can obviously can track and they can also 
think are they have the potential to have like debris medi mitigation or at least like removal capabilities. Um, and I think that's something that's a, a budding technology and the low earth orbit, um, the overcrowding in low earth orbit is, is, is a huge concern as we kind of talked about earlier. And so I think not something, definitely something that I want my research to touch on. Um, I kind of pivoted and, and looked at that digital divide and that was sort of what my low earth orbit uh, experience was for the time being. But I think that if we can find a way to allow these technologies, of course, it would be great if they could move debris to a different orbit or take it and then bring it back to study, right? And again, like further scientific research, but issues of liability do like arise there, right? Because if there's an issue, something breaks and then more, you know, debris spreads. And also again, tying it back to issues of security uh, if the satellite is compromised. Um, and so I think with a lot of these things, I know someone talked about mining. I know someone that like we've talked about all these things that seem kind of meta and for me, as someone who wants to be a future policymaker, you really have to ask yourself, like, why does it matter right now? And think short term and long term. And so all of these are great ideas, should definitely be explored. Like the R&D should definitely be there. But there's a lot of regulation and compliance that needs to be met before we get to the point where, you know, Starlink says, oopsies. And then one web says, it's all right, we got it, dude. Like, it's not going to be that simple. Um, so great opportunities again um i definitely support them especially as like crowding is an issue but again we'll see thanks so much I, can i just jump in real quick mira so there are a lot of different organizations that are trying to track space debris it's much easier to track it once it's our once the event has happened you know the united states military just in the past couple of years brought online a, a mission architecture called Space Fence, which consists of a lot of ground stations, but also a lot of uh, a couple in space uh, satellites that track satellites and debris in low Earth orbit, uh, as well as Neo and Geo. We can track much smaller pieces. It used to be we could only track to the size of a softball. Now we can go much smaller. Um, and what it's done is created this like immense amount of data that the 18th, um, which is a uh, space force um, has to deal with. And, and that all shows up in um, space track. I think you've got a couple of places like Astrograph, um, TS Kelso, Celeste Track that are doing this on the outsides. And then you've also got companies that are seeing this SSA, this space situational awareness of tracking satellites and debris as a business case to sell that data to the government, sell that data to companies so that they have a better idea of what's in the domain. Um, I know there's also a lot of labs that are doing this and they're trying to, you know, model the space environment. Um, I think the biggest challenge from what I've heard from my, my engineering friends um, is that it's really hard to predict where the debris will go uh, pr prior to impact. Um, and that's what makes ASAT testing really damaging, is that you can't actually predict where, where that debris might spread to. Yeah, I would just jump in and throw in a name, Jonathan McDowell. He's one of our Milamos colleagues, and he does this amazing work in tracking all kinds of space objects, including debris. So definitely a resource to check out. He maintains his own website, so definitely go check his work out. It's uh, phenomenal to the detail um, uh, he provides his website available publicly. Jonathan McDonald. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Johnson, Mr. Goswami, and Ms. Warner. I really appreciate you taking the time to be on our panel. Um, we have the expert-led small discussion breakout rooms happening right now, starting at four. Um, you can come up if you need to recheck who are the speakers, but I'm just going to quickly announce them. The workshop on climate refugees is in room 260. The workshop on nuclear proliferation is in room 601. Um, the global energy transition workshop is in room 180 and governing Bitcoin is in 160. I have this paper up here, so you guys can come and take a look at it and head to whichever breakout rooms um, you're interested in. Thank you, Thank you so much.